This is Thank You Mama Weekly Lessons for Mothers All Around the World. Hello and welcome to Thank You Mama. My name is Anna Tider and my guest today is Dr. Galit Atlas. Galit is an internationally known psychoanalyst. She's a psychoanalyst and clinical supervisor in a private practice in New York City and is on the faculty of the New York University postdoctoral program in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. <laughs> Khalid has published three academic books, numerous chapters and papers, and teaches and lectures throughout the USA and internationally. And her newest book is called Emotional Inheritance, A Therapist, Her Patients, and the Legacy of Trauma. And it explores the way our ancestor experiences shape our life. Galit is also a mom of two. Of um, three. Oh, you're a mom of three. I'm sorry, Galit. And you're not far from the truth because I had two pregnancies, but three children. I have twins. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, Galit. And before I say welcome, I really want to mention that this amazing book, Emotional Inheritance, as I just found out, is going to be translated in 17 different languages and published in 17 different countries, including, among others, Germany and Croatia. And I'm really, really, really highly recommending the book to everybody. Galit, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for recommending Emotional Inheritance to your listeners. I'm really excited to be here today. I was so deeply touched by this book. If I have had the time, and I'm also a mom, so I don't, but if I had a whole day, I would not stop reading it. I read it in two goes. <laughs> I could not, I really could not put the book down and I was sad when I had to stop reading and as we just spoke, I, it, the lights just went on. I was reading the book and I was like, oh, this is me. This is me. <laughs> and I'm so sure that many of your readers will have this experience and that it will help them to think about things and maybe change them or clear them out. Thank you. I hope so. That's my hope with writing this book, right? To help people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Galit, I'd like to start with a quote from your interview that I recently watched, where you said the patient is not the only person in the room with us. We have at least two more generations in the room. I think this is a beautiful segue into our conversation about our mothers and what we learn or inherit from them. Yeah, thank you so much. I feel that this is a wonderful beginning. And as a psychoanalyst, when I sit with patients, I'm very aware that I never sit only with the patient. And what I mean by that is not only that I sit with the patient and what happened to the patient and their relationship with their parents, which of course I do. Uh, we call that object relations and their first object relations, their first relationships, all of that. But in addition, I also sit with who the, the patient's parents were, who their grandparents were, what happened to them, their life experiences, their traumas, and the many ways that those live inside the patient without the patient's awareness. And, and, and you wrote in the book somewhere, it's very beautiful that You've learned through so many years of being a psychotherapist how interconnected we are. Because, as you say, some traumas we are not even aware of, but still, sometimes we have memories of them, sometimes we have dreams of them, sometimes we just, they hinder us in our own lives. And, and I found it very, very beautiful how you talk about how interconnected we are on a, on a different level, on... On, on, on a dim non dimension that's away from the visible or I don't know how to call it this this right. dimension we call it the unconscious to some degree right because yeah. we are there is this illusion and I think culturally especially in the last uh, decade there is illusion that we're separated that we could separate and this whole idea of being individuals which is of course important and separation is important but I think what you're talking about is a, is a 
is another register, right? Mm -hmm. Where we are all connected and where we are connected to our parents and grandparents and ancestors in ways that we're not fully aware of and we're not conscious of. And in the book, I talk a lot about unconscious communication, about the way we know each other, especially the people who raised us, who live inside us. We know them and we don't only know what they told us. We also know the gaps, Mm -hmm. what they didn't tell us, what we felt, right? And those, I call it in the book, the ghosts, right? The ghosts Mm. of what was not said and was not uh, explicitly communicated and still we know. Mm. I love that aspect of what is not said because there are always these narratives in our lives and our ancestors' lives and we know these narratives. But the question is always what was not said. I love it how you, you focus on that. Yeah, because what I see in my practice, and of course in the book I talk a lot about my own life too, and we can talk about that, but what I see in my practice with patients is that very often they and we know something and we don't always know how. How do you know that? How do you you (laughs) feel right? You feel it and and many times nobody even confirms it until in the the stories that I tell in the books, until something happens and and you connect the dots. Mm Mm-hmm. And now I want to read a, a, a short paragraph from the book or even a sentence from the book because I think it nicely explains why we should connect the dots. You say somewhere towards the end of the book where you talk about the unexamined life, I recognize that Alice or Alice needs to be able to find a way to accept both her mother and her father with all their imperfections and faults so she can accept herself with her human limitations. And I think that's, that's A, beautiful, because it connects to what we were talking, but also why we are talking in this podcast, <laughs> why I'm talking to all the wonderful ladies across the world about their mothers and their mothers' lives, because, as you say, by accepting them and their faults, we can accept ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. And our faults, right? We accept that we are not perfect, that we have limitations in in both concrete ways in our personalities, but also in a more existential way. Uh, we are all, we can all get sick. We can all, we are all going to die. You know, all of those things that as omnipotent children and teenagers and young adults, we are like, we feel like, that those things, right? We never think about getting older, or we never think, and we always think that we are going to do things better than our parents, which is great. <laughs> which we should you know? the patient, my patients who think that they can never do things better than their parents, their parents are so good, they're in big trouble, right? It is much healthier to think that we, that each generation can do something better than a generation before. But then you arrive into a place where you mature and maybe you become a parent or maybe even when you don't, right? You really look at yourself and you understand that you are limited and that you could look at your parents and you accept them. You accept them for who they are with their limitations and with their issues. Mm. Their limitations, yeah. This is where... We, I think we don't pay so much attention to. We never think about the fact that they had their struggles and their limitations and their surroundings and their, you know, w- once we start thinking about this, and this is what I'm learning through this podcast, it's easier to, for us to accept them and their faults and realize that they did the best they could in their own circumstances and in, within their own capacities. Yeah, most of them did, you know, mm-hmm. I, I most of, of exceptions and, and kids that experienced a lot of abuse. But I think what you're saying is really important that many, many, many parents, and I would say almost every parent becomes a parent and want to be a good parent. Mm. And not everybody is capable of being good enough for their child. And many of us judge ourselves or many people come to therapy because they want to be good parents 
And when you talk about how to look at those, this intergenerational thing, right, of how do we think about our parents and what kind of parents we become, we also look at the way we sometimes idealize our parents, which yeah. is also a way, right, a way of like, oh, my mother was so perfect. Your mother was not perfect because <laughs> nobody perfect, right? Yeah. And in the yeah. book, you know, there is that one chapter that talks mm-hmm. about that. I don't yes. know if you remember that chapter yeah, yeah. of Naomi and Bella, this this uh, woman who really idealizes her mother so much that she always felt so inferior mm. to her mother. All of it was that her father, right? If you think about the the triangle between mother, father, and mm-hmm. daughter, mm-hmm. her father really was so in love with the mother, and they were such a closed uh, system, the mother and the father. The daughter was always left out. Right. Mm-hmm. And every every sentence that starts with the word always is a problem. Right. It there is no flexibility in that system that the mother is always with the father. The father is always with the mother and the daughter is always an outsider. And that creates a whole dynamic when the patient says and at some point I describe in the book, she says, why, how come I don't have a great love life? Isn't isn't supposed to work like that, that if my parents were a great couple, then I inherit that and I'm supposed to have a great relationship? Isn't that how psychology works? And the answer is no, it's not how it works. Mm-hmm. Right? It, what you repeat in your romantic relationship is not necessarily only what your parents had, their relationship, but your relationship with them. Mm-hmm. Right. So if you included a child that never had the full attention and the full admiration, that is what you might repeat. And that's your psychological work to break that cycle. Mm. This is where my light went on when I learned that. I never thought about this before. So it's oh, so much work. <laughs> a lot of ongoing work, yes. right? Yes, Galit, I had a funny thought when I finished this book. And I, I thought... Once I speak to Galit, I want to ask her if she would please do a second version, volume two, which uh-huh. would be which would be about the positive things we inherit from our parents. Oh. <laughs> I thought I thought that would be a nice little booklet to go together, hand in hand with this book. Another, another thing. But you know, I'll tell you something. That's a beautiful idea, but I think less people will be interested in that because. We want to read what we, uh, you said before, like there is so much work, right? Yes. We are, we want to improve. We want to read what can help us. The positive, and I can name a few of the positive inheritance we have mm-hmm. from our parents, mothers, right? One of them is their resilience. One of them is their hope. Even even traumatized parents have, right, yeah. are yep. resilient. And we inherit those two with the trauma. But the truth is that like in real inheritance, when you get inheritance of of all of your parents' belongings, right, and you look at it, the problem is to differentiate what do I want and what I don't want and the guilt around the things I don't want and want to throw away. Uh, And my mother loved that so much, but I actually, what am I going to do with all of her, you know, paintings that I don't like, Uh, right? And how do I do that? What do I store for her? What do I get rid of, right? And when it comes to the positive things, and I I say that to patients often, you know, the positive part of our personality or the positive inheritance are not the parts that need me, you know? (laughs) Yes. Right, I. You don't need your your <laughs> beauty, your you know your strength. That's not why you're mm-hmm. here. I want to recognize it. I want to see it. I want to cherish it, and then go towards what you need and where the work has to be. What you mm-hmm. want to have, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, what you need from me is to help you with the parts that are more painful, because otherwise you won't come to see me, right? <laughs> For you, right? To process, to understand the difficult things, the things that are painful for you and were probably painful for the previous generations as well. Yes. So, Galit, we'll do this. Um, my Thank You Mama book is going to be the positive things. Leave it to me. <laughs> that's fantastic. So, that's how we divide. Yes. <laughs> 
the, the positive things. And I am going to do, I wouldn't call it the negative things no. because I love it is not negative, but I'm going to do the more painful. Uh, let, no, let's call it the things that need to be worked on. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Khalid, let's jump to, uh, to, to your mom. Let's talk about mom Shoshi. Yes. So she, this was fascinating for me. And thank you for including all of this in your book, because I really, you, you brought, widened my horizons. <laughs> mom Shoshi is from Syria originally. Right. She was born in Syria. Yes. And then she moved to Israel when she was only four years old. And I never knew about this 50s wave of Sephardic Jewish migration into Israel. This was new to me, and I'm very, very glad that I've learned it. Tell me, will you tell me a little about it? So it was a very painful, difficult immigration because uh, the Israel state was uh, founded by uh, European Jews even before World War II. And then after World War II, a lot of the Holocaust survivors and immigrants moved to Israel. And of course, uh, the state of Israel was founded on, on, you know, right after the Holocaust as a result of the persecution of Jews. So, uh, of course, you can imagine a, a land that, a, a country that is founded on the shadow of, of such a horrible thing, how, how complicated uh, that is uh, in so, so, so many ways. Uh, like in trauma, right? It's a traumatized mm -hmm. um which creates a lot of problems for everybody, uh, like like in real life with between people. And I think that part of what happened in that immigration is the 50s immigration after the state of Israel uh, was founded is came from Arab countries. And my parents were part of that immigration because basically Israel opened uh, the gates to all Jews from all over the world to move to the, what they call the Jewish land. And the people came, my, my dad moved from Iran and my mom immigrated from Syria. And a lot of people came from Iraq, from Yemen, from uh, other countries, all from all over the world. But the truth is that there was a lot of racism against Arabic Jews, because the Ashkenazic, the European tradition was the main, um, you know, the, the, the powerful one, the one in power, the white one, we mm -hmm. can call it, right? Mm -hmm. we, uh, the people of color. of uh, And still, you know, it's still it's still happening, not to that degree, but it's still, it is still, it is still a conversation, right? Mm -hmm. And there is still some division, less and less because a lot of people marry each other. So a lot of the next generations are kind of mixed, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's in that sense, it's less. But all of the positions of power and everything was was uh, really by uh, Ashkenazic European uh, Jews. And my parents were part of that immigration, uh, moving to uh, Israel without speaking Hebrew. My parents and my grandparents my, spoke uh, Farsi and, and, and um, Arabic. It was very shameful. Uh, Arabic mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, the mm -hmm. wrong language to speak. So my mother, as I describe in the book, was very ashamed when her parents listened to Arabic music or uh, or spoke Arabic at home. She was sh always shush them and say, just shh, don't, don't, I don't want people to know. And my mother is also very, you know, she's not dark. I'm, I'm much more darker than she is in my skin. And so she could kind of hide. And that's what she would say. Like, I'm hiding the fact that I'm actually, uh, these days we call it a person of color, that I'm Sephardic Jew. So people would think I'm Ashkenazic. So there was a lot of embarrassment and shame and feeling of inferiority uh, around that immigration that both my parents actually suffered mm. from, from from the racism of, of in the 50s. Mm. And I think that that in that's part of my emotional inheritance, uh, which is interesting, you know, because I live in the United States and on paper I'm supposed to be a white person, but I'm I'm so not mm -hmm. identified as white because all my life I was called like, uh, you know, names uh, because of my dark skin, and uh, so I feel like that is not it's 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 a confusion of identities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what happened to Mama Shoshi? Tell me a little bit about her life story before we jump into her lessons. 
Yeah. So, you know, my, my mom, Shoshi, she was born in Syria. And when she was four years old, they immigrated. Her immigration story is unbelievable. Mm. And it's in the in the too, because and I'm not going to tell the whole details, but uh, people will, can write or to, can read it in the book. But <laughs> yes. in two sentences, both my parents had uh, seven siblings, and when they escaped, uh, the border between Syria and Israel was closed. They had to sneak into the country, and they paid a Syrian uh, person, man, to sneak them in. And the family in the middle of the night went to the wa- on a wagon to, to drive into the border. And, and at some point they realized that they forgot my mother at home. And mm. her life story, right, is yeah. that's probably her first memory that she was forgotten. Mm. And they, they had to drive back and pick her up. She was asleep in her bed because it was the middle of the night. So she didn't actually know it but she of course that's then the story that she heard all her life how she was forgotten and they drove back and up and moved uh, they moved to a very poor neighborhood in Haifa and uh, mixed Jews and Muslims and she grew up there when she was 10 years old her older brother drowned uh, in the Mediterranean Sea mm. and that was the first trauma that we remember, and again in the book I describe like what we what we remember is not necessarily the first trauma. I mean, I do know she was very ill before when she was young and almost died, and I'm sure that that is another trauma that is is lived in her body, even if not in her memory. But that death of her oldest brother was a huge trauma for the whole family. Uh, for her and you know as it is usually in situations like that and on in traumatic situations in in childhood what you lose is not just the person Mm. you fought more right and in that situation for example you lose your parents to some degree too because they fall apart and never the same so you lose your brother you lose your parents you lose your family as it used to be you lose so much it's like you know in divorce a lot of the time the traumatic thing is not just that the parents are divorced like everything else you lose right you, you lose if your mother is depressed is your father has uh, you know as another family if you're like there's so many other factors of how this divorce goes that it, that includes all the losses that you will have and you know when thinking about divorce for example we always as therapists think like try to make the loss only the loss of the family and not those other waves of of loss that come mm. that come with it so when we think about my mother she really lost everything when she was 10 years and her mother never recovered of course from that uh, death and i think that is the main trauma that I, I dis- discuss in the book, in one of the chapters, as you remember, I discuss a patient mm-hmm. who comes to me mm-hmm. in her eyes. And in fact, in that moment, she is my mother. I, I am the therapist of, so to speak, my mother, because mm-hmm. that patient had a similar experience to the way my mother had. And my mother had never been in therapy, actually. Mm-hmm. To go back to Mama Shoshi, did she study? Did she have a profession? How did she meet your father? And did she move to the United States with you? Or you, did you go by yourself? Yeah, that's a good question. So she never had a profession. Uh, her profession was to be a wife and a mother. Very, very different from my profession. If you look at my life, uh, not only that I'm a, you know, I studied, but also... Uh, I was always, because of my mother, I think, very aware that this is not what I want to be. I want to be a mother, and I am a mother, but I don't want to be a professional mother and a professional. uh, I I needed to, I reacted to that, to the fact that she was not independent. She never had her own money. She never had her own career. She was very dependent on my father. And my parents are very happily married, which is Mm -hmm. uh, incredible. Part of her achievements, I think, very much thanks to her, because she's such a forgiving and uh, non-judgmental and not n- not moody. You know, she's very stable and 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 very caring person. So 
I think some of the marriage and what happened in the marriage is, is a lot of it is thanks to her. And both my parents actually live in Israel. And they, they did not move with, with me. I moved here when I was in my 30s. And I had, uh, like, or I actually was 30 mm-hmm. when I moved here, which, which is just, just to disclose, I'm 50 now. So it was uh, 20 years years ago and I uh, have I had my children here Mm. Mm. you must miss her and she must miss you does she have other siblings of yours that that are there with her still yeah so she she misses me a lot and I I don't think that I understood it at the beginning as much as I understand it now as a parent when uh, and I tell my kids you know don't you dare do to me what I did to my mother. <laughs> not move away. Even when they go to college soon and I tell them, like, you're not allowed to go to college more than five hours away. Uh, you know, you're not allowed to go to West Coast. So that's, uh, they call it hypocrisy and I think they're right. It is hypocrisy. <laughs> but now I understand the level of pain that a parent uh, feels when their child uh, leaves them. And my mother has two other children and uh, my sister Karen lives uh, in Tel Aviv very close to my parents and my brother sadly for my mother decided to move and follow me Mm. so and his wife moved to the U.S. around three years ago so that that also forces my parents and my mother to come here that's good Right. Yeah, that yeah. brightens horizons and moving, moving around and traveling is always good for the spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Khalid, let's jump into lessons. I would love to hear what you've learned from her. So you know, there are probably so many, many, many <laughs> things. I want to yes. start with something concrete that I actually didn't tell you, and I thought about it now, and I thought about the food. My yeah. mother taught me to cook and I love cooking and uh, that is one of the maybe only things that I didn't push back at and rebelled against and did you know some people that when their mother is a cook they they don't touch they don't enter the kitchen and they're like no I'm not going to be like my mom and I'm not and for me it was the opposite I really love cooking I love hosting I love you know big uh, groups of people over and so that's one thing that she taught me mm-hmm. as I said before my mother is not a judgmental person and I took it for granted all my life because I didn't know that other mothers existed as, until a certain point when I realized, huh, some mothers are really judgmental of their children. And that's really unusual that your mother doesn't tell you, why are you looking like this? Why are you, you know, why? Are you? And she looks at you and says, wow, this is so pretty. How did you do that? I think some of it was because of her own insecurity, right? And she f- always felt that. I was her firstborn and she always felt like, wow, how do you know that? And how did you do that? And some of it was because she was an immigrant. So when she was young, right, she was, she didn't know a lot. She didn't know the language. She didn't know. So something about me being, you know, native back then and knowing things and knowing speaking so fast. And so I think that is something that really built my personality in a a, she was very generous with me that's beautiful tell me you mentioned about her being scared and that teaching you to be brave I can't wait to hear about that (laughs) because it sounds so contradictory yeah you know we don't only learn what our parents teach us because of uh, uh, you know who they are. We, sometimes it is because we have no other option but to be something else, or because we want to be something else. My mother was experienced a lot of trauma in her life, and I think it's part of why she was very scared internally and was not adventurous and did not go to work or study or do things outside in the out there in the world. Very very much hidden behind my father, and I think that looking at that. I always wanted to be brave. That was as as a reaction, but also as a fact that when I was with her and she was scared, I was the brave one, right? (laughs) So if she couldn't talk to someone, I would say, I'll tell them that. 
And I would go ahead of her and say, so we would like to do the, 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 right? And I would be the representative of her because she was, I experienced her from a very young age as, uh, as very vulnerable and, uh, and frightened mm-hmm. and insecure. And so I think that to some degree, I want to say, allowed me to be um, brave and sometimes more brave than I actually was, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but but I think that that was a lesson that I learned and developed in my relationship with her. Did she support you with it? W- would she push you to be brave or not necessarily? No, no, she wouldn't tell me that I should be brave, not explicitly. Mm-hmm. It is just that she was a little passive. And then I always thought like, okay, so I should do it, you know? And, and I think, again, we can't leave my dad out of it, especially because they were such a tight unit that I identified with him. That was, that's the way he was, mm-hmm. right? So I, I think it's some degree I, I copied him when I was with her. So I did what mm-hmm. he would do. Mm-hmm. And it's not that she encouraged me explicitly to be brave. Uh, the opposite, she she probably told me, uh, "Be careful. Why are you doing this? And what if right everything I did? What if people don't like it? Or what mm-hmm. if people judge you? Or what if it's uh, what if it's going to be hard? Don't you know?" But I think there was something about her relationship with my dad that encouraged me to be more like him and balance her with my right with with being more active and and being more out there in the world you know I was in the book I describe I was a performer when I was young I was a singer a musician I was on stages it's exactly the opposite Mm -hmm. my my, my mom is so shy and she's so you know embarrassed to be on stages and I was uh, and she's like a homemaker and I was always out there in the world um, doing my own thing. Let's talk about hard work. You know, it's fascinating. I've done around 100 interviews or even more at this stage with women from literally all over the world and very different backgrounds. And it's, it's fascinating how often I hear my mom taught me hard work. Oh, yeah? Mm-hmm. yeah you know, because mothers have no other choice. They work really, really hard. As mothers, we work super hard. You can't be a mother and not work hard, right? It is something is not going to work for you. <laughs> it's like it's such a hard work. It, for pregnancy even is a hard work. And, and breastfeeding or feeding or waking up in the middle of the night. And like being a parent is such a hard work. And so many of us, I think, learned from our mothers to work hard. But then there's also the point of n- never resting. And this is another thing that I hear a lot. And and I, I, I put it on the other generations. You know, we are completely different generation now. We like our yoga and self-care. But many, many women say, I wish my mom took a rest sometimes, not only for her sake, but also that I would learn how to take a break. And that I'm allowed yeah. to take a break. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that is, it gives us permission, right? If your mother knew how to rest, it's, uh, sometimes when I talk with patients and we talk about patients who try to be mothers and are afraid to be selfish. And, and sometimes the frame, the right frame is to say, you want to teach your child to take care of themselves. And you don't teach them that only through taking care of them. You teach them that when they see that you can take care of yourself, that you could be selfish sometimes, that you could rest sometimes, that you can take care of yourself, that you can take care of your own needs. And that teaches them to be able to take care of their needs. Mm. You know, and the balance between you taking care of them and you taking care of themselves, not right? Something that feels balanced between the two, that you're not only taking care of them, but you're not only taking care of yourself. And so I agree with you that, Many mothers and many people, right, really struggle with that, with that balance. And my mother definitely was one of them, you know, that couldn't, uh, you know, couldn't rest uh, being, I think she grew up with a mother who always uh, told her that she should not be lazy, 
you know, and I think if you remember, like my mother grew up with a lot of siblings. So I, I assume I imagined that her mother had a really hard time raising so many kids and she needed the kids to do work, to right, help her and do the dishes. And they were, they had a lot of things that they did at home, like clean the house. And my mother always tells me that when she was young, they used to clean and vacuum and, and do the dishes and, and sew and, you know, and do all of these uh, home uh, tasks. And their mother really, really um, scolded them, I want to say, if they rested and if they, they were what she called lazy. A girl should never be lazy, especially a girl. That's That was her, um, you know, that was her motto, motto, which is, of course, very upsetting to hear, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, especially when it's when it's focused on the girls and how the girls should do the work. Mm. I heard this from my guest from Mozambique or Tanzania. I can't remember anymore, but, but a mom who grew up in Africa. The same thing. Yeah. The brother was allowed to take a rest and relax and not do things, but girls are never allowed to be lazy. Girls had to work the whole time. Ah, oh, there's so much we still have to work on and change in this world. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And I think in different cultures, in certain cultures, it's even more than in other cultures for sure that the girls need to do all the work. Yeah, Galit. Yeah. If Before we jump into my my one of my favorite questions, which is, was there anything that you wish she taught you? Is there anything mm -hmm. else you would like to share that she did teach you? Uh, no, I think I went over my, uh, you know, my ma the main things that I, I'm sure that I can find more <laughs> uh, things that I had in mind. I did. Uh, wow, what I wish she taught me. That's a really really hard question, you know. I think what I wish she taught me is to be uh, to be able to be completely alone because my mother could never be alone and she always needed other people around her. And I think I can be alone much, much more. But deep inside, I think that I also learned that it is scary to, to be alone. And I wish I could do that better. Wow, that's a beautiful and very important lesson for us to end our interview with. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Galit, thank you so much. Let me just quickly recap your lessons. We had food and cooking and hosting and bringing big groups of people To, to one's home. We have a mom who is not ju judgmental and he, who is very generous with you. A mom who is scared and shy and vulnerable, which taught you to be brave and adventurous and, and dare to put yourself out there. And a mom who taught you to work hard. And here we also spoke about not relaxing. And we spoke about the importance of moms showing by example that we also need to take care of ourselves. And then at the end, we spoke about something you wish she taught you, which is to be alone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Galit, thank you so much again for being my guest. We learned so much from you. And I'm again recommending all my listeners to read your book. It's really very, very inspiring. Thank you so much, Anna. This was a real pleasure for me. If you enjoy Thank You Mama and want to help it grow, please take the two seconds to leave a five star review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps. If you'd like to get in touch, you can send me a mail at info at thankyoumama.net. You can also find me on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter under Anna Tider, that's T-A-J-D-E-R. This was Thank You Mama. Come back next week, subscribe and tell your friends. <laughs> <laughs>